Hey, everybody. Good to see you again. Welcome back. Glad we have a little small crew here. I actually like the smaller better. So we have a little bit more intimate conversations and can have a little bit more of a realistic dialogue. So uh, so we've been talking for quite exhaustively about right speech, right action, right livelihood. Tonight, we're going to talk about right livelihood um, and try to get a framework for that that's maybe going to be helpful. Um, so where to begin? Um, it's great too that the talks you put on YouTube look great. So that means you know people if they if they've missed one they can kind of watch them. So that's kind of good. Um, it was funny. I was downstairs packing, getting ready to go for this trip, and putting my three year old in the tub and trying to get the coffee ready for the morning. Like I was like, this is like right lively, like running around the house like a lunatic. You know, it's like, uh, and uh, I said, I said I gotta talk. I said I gotta teach on right livelihood for ninety minutes. I was like, how the fuck am I gonna pull that off? <laughs> so. Um, so let's just think about this for a second. So here, here's part of my theory on this, is that I said before, I believe in the early canon, uh, and at the time of the Buddha, there were two Dharma paths that were offered. And there was a path for monastics, people who wanted to join the monastery and take 227 precepts and do that whole Buddhist monastic thing, which we know lots and lots and lots about because it's been going on for 2,500 years in various Asian countries and different cultures and there's all different forms and styles of it uh, and there's so much out there on it and you know and I also want to remind everybody that I'm, I'm a huge fan of it I'm pro monastic I'm not anti monastic I, I love and appreciate that tradition again I'm just not doing that and I'm not going to do that so uh, when you look at the way the Buddha taught to people who were non monastics we find he speaks of us in terms of being artisans uh, craftsmen tradespeople, people basically of the world who are doing some kind of business in the world so that we can survive. And so here's the other thing to think about. If the true Dharma path, if, 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 the, if Buddhism was meant to be a, a Buddhist endeavor only, if it was only meant for monastics, then why would the Buddha even bother putting a whole path factor in on right livelihood? If right livelihood means to be a monk or to be a nun or to join a monastery, then it would be irrelevant to have that teaching. It wouldn't make sense. It would be an, it would be assumed that that's what you were going to do. And when you look, and so because we have a 2,500 year old tradition where most of the stuff that we get, most of the commentaries, most of Buddhism, if not all of it, is largely a monastic tradition, and they don't say a lot about livelihood because they don't have much to say about livelihood because they're monks. So when we look to the early tradition and we look to any form of Buddhism, we go on retreat, you know, you usually hear a little kind of 20 minute Dharma talk at the end of every retreat about how to integrate this stuff back in. And it's usually pretty unhelpful, I find. I've given many unhelpful talks on this at the end of retreats. Um, so I'm as guilty as everybody else. So when we really wanna rethink these path factors, again, when we think about right speech, we really should be thinking about practicing how do we find our voice in the world. And again, that starts with the voice that I speak to in my own mind. How do I talk to myself? What is going on with that voice? Is it a dialogue? Is it an argument? Is it a blame fest? You know, what is going on there? And usually when we sit down to meditate or to practice cultivating any kind of meditative experience, as soon as you close your eyes, what happens? Boom, there's that voice right there. The Buddha calls it papancha, mental proliferation. As soon as I sit down every day and close my eyes to meditate, there I'm just right in it. My mind, me, my life, my stories. There's, there's, a, there's a dialogue going on. I don't know, maybe I'm unique in this, but I suspect that you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then the dialogue usually goes, hey, dude, shut up, I'm trying to meditate, or something of that nature. And so I'm already, already in a kind of battle. You know, thinking is bad, thinking is wrong. I'm trying to pay attention to my breathing, my thinking. Can, we, we automatically create this kind of struggle with the mind. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 25 years deep in that, in the victim of that. So I, I understand that. So I think we have to rethink some of this stuff. And so when we find our voice, and part of that, of course, is doing 
I, I feel a huge part of that is doing Brahma Vihara phrases or doing the illimitables as they're called in the Abhidharma or the immeasurables as they're called in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, kindness, compassion, gratitude, and equanimity. That is the voice of the mind in which we're looking for. Do I have a voice that speaks in kindness, to, in, that speaks in care, that speaks in gratitude and appreciation, that speaks in understanding? My inner voice does not embody those qualities all of the time. I can certainly tell you that. And then let alone trying to do that with people in the world. So if, if I just stopped right there and that was all we did tonight, you would have a whole bunch of stuff to bring to your life. You would be very busy. I suspect you spend a lot of time talking. And then rethinking um, Samakama, which is translated as right action. The interesting thing about this that I find is that Samakama, Kama in Pali is, is, is a correlated to karma, which is a word that is grossly misunderstood. Karma in, in Sanskrit, we, people talk about karma, the Buddha taught karma. Um, and so it's interesting that they don't translate it as right karma, which wouldn't make a lot of sense. Like how do you develop the right kind of karma? But it's not Kama. Samakama is, would be action, it's actually kamanta, which means, again, vocation. We talked about this exhaustively last week. Vocation, a kind of calling, a kind of how, what do we feel inspired to do in the world, of the world, with the world, you know? That, and, and so I think if we're practicing the Dharma, it's very important that we highlight the reality and probably for most of you, the fact that, one of the callings you've had is a calling to have a kind of liberated experience, a calling to wake up, a calling to to use Dharma as a path for getting you to where you want to go, for overcoming challenges, for probably a whole bunch of things. And you could actually see your introduction in your in your sincerity and your commitment and whatever that looks like for you. Uh, your engagement and posturing with this dharma thing as a kind of calling and then that puts us in the unique position of like now we have all this dharma work to do you know and part of that is meditation and in that but 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 we've we've limited ourselves and then we look at sama ajiva ajiva literally means for life what do i do for life so it's not totally it, it makes sense to me that that would have gotten translated as livelihood for life my livelihood but it's really what i do for life what i do to sustain my life isn't so much my livelihood as much as what it's what i do to survive now this teaching gets very interesting if you start to unpack the meaning behind this and the implications behind this so in the world that i live in the conditions that i live i have to survive i have to basically make money right that's kind of what it boils down to is i need to have a certain degree of financial security so i can pay rent and eat food and drive cars and uh, help me and for me my children and you know i i have so many financial responsibilities so many none of which i could renunciate they're all they all need to happen you know i i i've, I've got to pay my mortgage and my car insurance and my health insurance like there's no renunciation there i have that stuff needs to happen and then i'm stressed with the challenge and the and the responsibility of trying to figure out how i can navigate the world in a way that's allowing me to make that kind of income to make that kind of money and of course there's a tremendous emphasis on doing this ethically now trying to make ethical money in this culture is not necessarily all that easy and so the other thing that's really kind of sad that I'll say um, is that to be able to practice the Dharma, to be able to actually have a Dharma practice is a kind of privileged experience. And so even when the, when the Buddha set up the monastic tradition and set up the monastic kind of, I don't want to say rules, but the kind of paradigm, he basically made it very clear that if, if people are going to be monks, the monastery needs to provide them with food, needs to provide them with shelter, needs to provide them with medicine, you know, needs to provide them with, with, with shelter, housing. So the Buddha was very clear that the, the, the role of the monastery was to provide the basic human needs for the people who were monks so that they could actually practice. 
They needed to be warm. They needed to be fed. They needed to be cared for. They needed to have access to medicine when they were sick. I don't know about you, but most of my adult life, I did. I haven't health insurance is a, is a rare experience for me. I, I, you know, my, my health insurance was dude, don't get sick, you know? And so a lot of people in our culture don't even, I mean, that, that to have health insurance in our culture, and even if you have health insurance, it doesn't cover jack shit. So, you know, we actually culturally, a lot of people, and, and also there's a huge segment of communities where they just, that's not really, um, a lot of people to, to eat every day and, and to sustain life, which is part of surviving is actually occupies so much of their time and energy that they're not going to have time to sit for 45 minutes or go on these long retreats at these super nice, expensive retreat centers. That's, that's not going to work. And so really what it comes down to, I think, and I think the Dharma world needs to think about this a little bit more especially in the white awake work that I've done and trying to really kind of wake up as a white person, especially as a fifth gendered male, like kind of top of the food chain, right? Like, you know, having all this privilege my whole life that I didn't even really notice or recognize because part of privilege is you don't have to think about this kind of stuff. But a lot of it, you know, as I've worked in, in, in prisons and jails and incarcerated environments and in, in communities that didn't have a lot of resources, and there can be this kind of whiteness around wanting to teach the Dharma or teach mindfulness to these lower income or to these communities where they're like, their, their survival needs aren't even being met. And like meditation is not actually what they need, probably. And it's well-intentioned, but it's not always like, you know, to assume what people need is actually kind of a privileged thing, isn't it? To assume what somebody else might need without listening to what they might need. So that really sets things up in a way that we need to really kind of think about how we uh, bring Dharma into the world to address really some of the needs of the world that we live in, and which is why, you know, I started the Secular Dharma Foundation, and that's a very secular thing to do. That's the first criteria of secularity is to improve the quality of life for everybody. You know, is, is the goal and the aim is to try to make sure everybody has their basic needs met. And that that's a pretty noble endeavor. Whether we can teach people mindfulness or all these SEL and all these other programs that are great, maybe it's kind of a little bit too far down the road. So really what it comes down to is safety. Survival is actually really all about safety. And if I'm worried about food and I'm worried about medicine and I'm worried about my kids and I'm worried about survival, I don't feel safe. And so when you think about this kind of survival experience, um, we might have a richer, more broad perspective on how we can develop this practice or how we can really be positive agents of change in the world. And so we, and so also what this puts us down to, I think also too is, and this doesn't get talked about, they don't, you don't hear about this a lot in Dharma teacher trainings or, or the Dharma world in general. Of course, the Dharma world is so new. We, we have to have some forgiveness and some humility that they, they really don't know what, we don't really know what we're doing yet, frankly. We're, Americans haven't been doing this very long and we're trying the best that we can. But it really comes down to what kind of a relationship do I have with money? And I would probably argue everybody on this call, we all have very unique financial situations. Some people were born with money. Some people's families have money. Some people have no money. Everybody has a pretty unique kind of financial condition. And then on top of that, we all have a unique relationship to money. We maybe we feel greedy towards money. We want to have more of it or we feel aversive to it. We don't want to deal with it. And one of the things that can happen for Buddhists that certainly happened for me, and I'm definitely guilty of this, is we can kind of fall into this really bad thinking that money is like bad and evil. Money is wrong, having money is wrong. Um, and I think this is, and, and what, what that does is, and I have this too, I've taken me a long time to overcome this, having a kind of poverty mentality. We're like, I, I shouldn't want too much or I shouldn't expect too much or I should be, I should be grateful with what I have because I, you know, I have a lot more than a lot of other people and the kind of way we put this kind of weird pressure on ourselves. And the interesting thing is there's lots of stories and lots of scenarios in the canon where there's people of the time of the Buddha. So the Buddha had a secular world too, uh, is that there was a lot of wealthy people who would come to him and say, I really want to follow you. 
you know, I really, I've heard you talk. I, I, I'm interested in the practice. I, I like what you're saying, you know, like I really want to, you know, and I, but I have all this money. Shouldn't I just give all my money? Who should I give my money to? Shouldn't I just give all my money away and just join the monastery? And the Buddha would always push back against that and say, you should absolutely not do that. Because you have all this money and you have all this good fortune, you have the unique opportunity to really support the vision of Dharma. You know, you can you can support the monks, you can give us land, you can build monasteries. You actually, because you have this power, really what money is is power, and you have this influence, you should use that money for good. It would be foolish and irresponsible of you to give that money away. And so part of it, for those of us who have money, I've never really had money, so I don't know what the experience is like, but it's actually being empowered with that and saying, okay, like I'm going to use this because money, money can be a weapon or it can be a tool, just like most things. And so that, that's really kind of when we think about livelihood or we think about surviving, I think we have to come into terms with our own relationship and our own fears and our own greeds and our own aversions about how we posture and how we feel about and how we are in denial about or how we are all of the different unique and kind of probably bizarre relationships that you have towards money. So when you look at these path factors in this kind of way of finding your voice, doing your work and, and having to navigate survival, when I look at it that way, they become very, very relevant to the life that I'm living. In fact, that's mostly what I'm doing most of the time. So I'm, you know, and then you bring in some mindfulness, right, to that experience. You bring in some focus and some effort and some view. You bring the, if you bring the other path factors up to this, now you have a very rich and very available Dharma practice that is really guided by your sense of integrity and by your sense of values and by your sense of really uh, taking things on in a way. Because what, what happens to me is I get caught into the two dead ends, the two dead ends, the Buddha always, he says this at the beginning of the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, it's in the original text, but most people leave it out. He says, I teach a middle way between two dead ends. And he's usually, it's, it's usually described as the dead end of, uh, of materialism or sense pleasure or the dead end of annihilation or self-mortification. But if we get away from that ancient language, really what he's talking about is the dead end of capitalism and the dead end of poverty, right? So I think it's really important that we can kind of try to understand that that's very real in our world is that we, we, we kind of, how can we be in the middle of those things? Um, we live in a capitalistic world in a greed kind of based world, you know, and so, but we also don't want to uh, have poverty mentality or feel like we don't deserve or we should settle or these kinds of things because, I mean, this is just my opinion, but it seems to me that all the wrong people have all the money. That's kind of what you know what I mean. That seems to be the big problem here. And so, you know, people generally don't get them, don't become billionaires because they're philanthropic or generous. That's not how that works. So I think we have to, you know, there's a woman actually who wrote a book. It's a really great book. My wife's really into it because she saw her speak. Her name's Lynn Twist. She's kind of really popular in the philanthropic world. She wrote a book called The Soul of Money. I had to read it in my Dharma teacher training. It's a really interesting perspective. If you've never seen it, um, it's a really kind of, it was kind of written from the perspective of fundraising. And she's one of those people who raises money for great organizations. She's a totally righteous lady. But um, the whole book is about trying to just change the way that we think about money. And the idea that thinking about money is kind of evil or wrong or bad is really, really kind of what's gotten us into the mess that we're in. And she even changes the language from nonprofits and we have nonprofit organizations to social profit, which I think is a great switch. We have a nonprofit. Sometimes I, my wife tries to remind me, I try to say we have a social profit because what nonprofits really are trying to do is to trying to promote and create positive social change. And so it's getting away from this nonprofit business to like, yeah, we have we social profit. We want our society to profit off of our work which is really, which is actually the mission of nonprofits, you know, generally speaking. 
So I think that thinking about these things in different ways is good. I do want to do a meditation practice. It's a little bit of a difficult meditation practice. There's no instructions that I am aware of a, of a guided practice on livelihood. So um, what we'll do if, if I think what, what I what I what feels appropriate to me is doing um, a practice of kind of sila metta of like a, a generosity, goodwill, kindness, and really trying to, to actually establish in our own experience an inner sense of safety so that we feel supported and then and then from that place, then only then can we actually be uh, have a positive posture and experience towards the world. So I'll, I'll do some instructions on this. I'll try to keep it light because this is more of a, a reflection. I'm asking you to do kind of more of an experiment rather than a, a traditional guided Dharma practice. But I suppose we can do whatever we like. So you can just find a comfortable way to sit that's upright upright posture. And I'll start and end with the bell. So just coming into your seated posture, your direct experience as it is. And as best you can, unhooking from the mind stream, the thoughts that carry us away, that carry us into the past and the future. And then bringing your awareness to the area of your body from your the tip of your chin, scanning slowly, letting go of any tension or tightness at the neck or throat area, allowing the breathing to move through the hollow spaces of the mouth. Observing the rising of the in-breath, breathing in, connecting and sustaining your attention with the full length of the in-breath. Observing the out-breath as it falls, the chest falls, drops. Connecting and sustaining your attention with the full length of the out-breath. And then slowly directing the attention down to the area around your belly button, softening the belly. So just being mindful, just generally observing the sensations of the body from the tip of the chin to the belly button softening that area. And here together, just cultivating this mindfulness of the breathing body together for the next few minutes.
And as you become more in tune, more in touch with your heart center area, to just see if you can access your own sense of ease, of safety, your contentment, friendliness, a quality of metta. Just this simple acceptance of things as they are right now. A quality of good enough. Bringing a friendly attitude, a sense of ease towards the body. May I be at ease with this body. May I be at ease with the comfort and discomfort of this body, the age of this body. May I be at ease with the sexuality of this body. And just befriending your vehicle for life. through your breathing, through your entire biological system has supported you every moment up until right now. See if you can just be friendly, kind, and even appreciative towards this basic ability to survive, to live, to even be here at all. And then as you breathe in and breathe out and cultivating this inner space of ease, of metta, of a kind friendliness, to also get in touch with your sense of generosity, dana. Just the way in which you're being generous with your own mind right now by giving yourself your own undivided attention. Really paying attention and bringing this full mindful awareness to the body. To the very vehicle of your own survival. As you practice in this space of generosity, it can even be helpful to acknowledge and to recognize that your practice is a generous act to the world. Your willingness, sense of integrity to be present for this life in this way. Your intentions of kindness and compassion and gratitude is a generous gesture an act of generosity towards everybody who you encounter.
And as you breathe in and out, to so just see if you can tap into whatever amount of that is there, this kind, friendly, generous goodness. That's just already here. Well wishing. This foundation of practice is Dana Sila Bhavana, the cultivation of generosity and goodwill. And bringing these path factors, integrating those into this direct experience of finding this internal voice. This internal voice of non-harming, of kindness, of generosity and goodwill. And in doing this, finding this, developing this, we are doing our work our Dharma work, transforming, transforming our own hardwiring of greed, hatred, and confusion through generosity, non-harming, and understanding. and extending this quality of gratitude, of appreciation for just a basic 
ability to even be here at all. As we touch into the pulse of life itself, rising and falling with each in and out breath. And seeing if we can shift to understanding that our sense of survival of our monetary needs is only in service of our ability to do this work. And then holding that together here in silence for the last five minutes of this practice.
All right, y'all, thank you very much for your practice this evening. A fairly sleepy practice for me at 9.32 here on a Tuesday night. So love to hear any any thoughts, questions, or reflections you have about the practice we just did or about anything that I said earlier in relation to this um, this uh, very important part of our practice. Yeah, please, Jenny. Well, who was the name of the person that wrote the book, The Soul of Money? Lynn Twist. It's a woman named Lynn Twist. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Hugh, please. Yeah, I just wanted to, this is, I, I diverge. I just want to thank you from last week. Um, you spoke about um, your, your secular, secular approach to practice, and that was really liberating for me. I, oh, I studied great. with a, I studied with a, I, I, I don't want to name him. I studied with a buddy of yours who used to be a monastic. Huh. Um, and he lives. He, uh, he he's definitely a friend of yours. But I, I would always feel guilty, like man, like, and he is a true believer, and like. Right. Um, I've spoken at length with Brendan about this, but like, um, I always felt like, man, I'm not enough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sign me up for that one. Yeah. That, and so, I didn't fucking and so, feel that way. And so that it was, I, I appreciate you saying that last week. And, uh, and, you know, I've studied with him for a couple of years, but, uh, and came to it out of recovery at, uh, uh, yeah. And like, you know, um, he would come through and teach. Um, and, the guiding teacher, you know, that was, it didn't seem like enough. So I felt like I need to study with somebody, but, but I appreciate you saying that. Uh, no, I appreciate you saying that because I, I've kind of been in the closet around my secular approach. And I, I've worked with Stephen Batzer for years and I've mostly just as somebody who's so dedicated to the Dharma and, and looking at these path factors being like, Buddhism's just not giving me enough. Like I need more. I'm, you know, I just need more. Like I talk all the time. I work. I, I, I live in the world. Like I need more stuff. You know, <laughs> to make me feel like I'm doing this. And in the secular world, provides a lot of that. And you know, I think that um, you know, Stephen Batcher wrote the book after Buddhism, and I feel like this is a conversation about what comes after Buddhism. And um, you know, and I, I don't need to reject or dismiss. I'm a Buddhist fanatic. I love Buddhism. But there's some, st I need to be honest with myself about the world that I live in. And that's one thing I like about secular practices is there's, just, there's an opportunity for more dialogue. Like you go into a Buddhist center and the teacher's up on the throne or up on the dais. And it's like, there's, an, and there's a kind of implicit understanding that they have all the answers and that you don't. And it's kind of not really appropriate or allowed or even seen as disrespectful, heretical to question or to say, I don't, I don't think so, or I don't agree with that. Uh, and and that, that's a problem. That, that, that's a very religious thing. That, that's, a, that's a problem. And so growing up in America and living in, in Western educated, you know, institutions, you go into a college or university, it's totally appropriate to do that. To, you know, to have an open dialogue about the material that's being presented. And I'm very, that's what I'm very interested in moving forward is trying to create a framework where we're not chucking this stuff out and trying to reorganize it. When I have a tremendous reverence and respect for the Buddhist tradition, but I feel like we can bring a critical thinking and skepticism and say, and that's why I've been so obsessed with the early canon, because when you start really looking at the early teachings, you start to see a lot of the stuff that's in there. Buddhism says very different things. And then, then that creates a whole can of worms that you, you can, you can go as far as you like to through that can of worms. I'm, I'm too, in, too deep in at this point to turn back now. So, so it, it, I'm happy to hear you say that Hugh. I appreciate that. Cause it makes me feel like, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a, cause I, I'm, I'm certainly in a small category of people who see it this way. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Dave. Yep. Um, so two things. Um, first, 
I work at the IRS and I'm getting ready to retire. And I wish as my parting act, I could, I could approve your change in the title of nonprofit to social profit. Totally great <laughs> idea, right? <laughs> I applaud that uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, and, and as I am getting ready to retire, I've been thinking about these, these things a lot about what I want to do with the, you know, the next phase of my life. So um, these words around vocation and, you know, livelihood, um, you know, making a life uh, are really on point and part of the reason why I joined your class. So I just wanted to, to, uh, to tell you that I appreciate it. And, and, and I too really have always strongly believed and advocated for a secular path, a more, a more, um, uh, equal treatment for um, lay or householder practitioners uh, who seriously practice that, that that's entirely worthy. You know, there's nothing you know better or worse about either way of practice. So I <laughs> applaud your approach a lot, and uh, I you know, wish you well um, in your teachings. I hope this this takes off. We can we'll see. I, I mean. I appreciate that. You know, we'll see. Mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to do a bunch of stuff with it now. So it's, uh, um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, and I, I think it's, um, it's re reassuring because I think that, I think a lot of people actually feel this way, but they don't know how to say it or where to say it or if they can say it or uh -huh. maybe you haven't been contextualized in a way. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. Right. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Claudia, please. Uh, Dave, I was, wondering whether you could talk about like what is a, a healthy or balanced uh, relationship to money because as you were talking I don't feel like I'm greedy I'm retired now so, you know but I don't feel like I'm greedy and I don't feel like I don't deserve it either but when I do my meditation and I think about you know what some of the Buddhist precepts say may I be happy and all the causes of happiness or wishing that to others and the causes of happiness, meaning uh, free of attachment to things. And just like you were talking about, like I am fortunate to have a comfortable life and uh, not to have to worry much about paying my bills. But if I didn't have the money, I would certainly be very anguished <laughs> mm -hmm. about it. And so I just feel like, how can you not be attached to money? And you know what I'm saying? It's like- I not, do, it's not, tricky. Not, I think not, it, not, yeah, so what, what it, sound, it sounds like to me that you have a healthy relationship with money, actually. It sounds like you've, you've done okay for yourself. You seem like you're, you know, for you, this is maybe not such a big thing, uh, you know, and, and, and to recognize but that. If I didn't have that. it, it would be a big thing. Well, the, the, we don't do uh, hypotheticals here in the Dharma practice so much, you know. <laughs> so, but but I think part of I think what that what what, what that calls for is, is a true sense of appreciation and enjoyment and 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 uh, a kind of gratitude sure. that you have those conditions and to and to not squander those, uh, the goodwill, and, and to, to help it that. whenever I can. Yeah, that's you know? great. I'm with you. I think that's great. I sound like you're you're there. And not everybody's there. So, um, if there's any, I, I have some points I want to cover. I have a little, quite a bit of time. But if there's any other questions or thoughts, I'm, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end. If there's anything that you want to ask or say before we move on, all right, cool. Well, being inspired and encouraged by what Hugh had to say, I'm, I am actually going to offer some uh, what I call sort of five points of. What, what is a secular kind of perspective on livelihood or money or work, you know, and I'll cover all of them in a way that we can feel like maybe uh, encouraged and inspired to do so. And so uh, the, the first one that I think is, is really important to point out is trying to have what I would call appropriate happiness in our work. And that means even if we have a job that we don't like or it's a, not a, a wonderful job or a dream job, can we find some degree of appropriate happiness in the work that we currently have? Maybe you don't like your job, but maybe some of your coworkers are cool and 
you know, maybe there's probably some things going on in your work life that maybe are interesting or beneficial. And can we actually practice into those? Because I've, I've had jobs in my life. I've had tons of jobs. I've had a lot of crappy jobs. And one of the things that made my crappy job, like crappy construction jobs, like demo jobs, just like hard manual labor when I was in my 20s, what made those jobs meaningful was I, the people that I worked with. We had a friendly relationship and we would talk at work and we would kind of, it would help us get through. So I think that even if you don't like your job or you don't feel like you're in the right job or you know you want to do something else, you want to try to figure out a way that you can practice with the work that you're doing now, the survival work that you're doing now, so that way you can be at ease in that space. You can understand uh, that it's you know maybe not that the dream come true, but there's something you're getting out of it, and maybe all you're getting out of it is like shelter and food, and that's actually pretty good too. So I think we need to find an appropriate happiness with our work. The other one, and maybe the most obvious one is can, and this can be hard, can we find work that's non-harming or at least harm reduction? You know, can we find a, a work where we're not contributing to harm? We're not um, contributing to social harm, environmental harm, you know, and, and working in, in an institution or a facility or, or whatever it is where we feel as though we're not, we're not really contributing to things that are really, really harmful or destructive. Um, and, you know, let's be honest, the, those, the, the jobs and the careers that really pay well and make a lot of money, a lot of those are in industries that actually create a lot of harm. You know, not all of them by no stretch, but I think a lot, when you look at a lot of, you know, the environmental impact on some of the, some of the work that you can do, the, the financial impact on, on other people, the, 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 you know, working in places where you're contributing to the already increasing horrible wealth gap that we have. Um, and sometimes we might find, and I, and I've met many people like this along my journey who actually had to leave high paying careers because they just couldn't stomach it. They just couldn't, you know, and, and, and it's hard too. when they're like, oh, now I'm going to like, I'm making all this money and I have all this hedonic pleasure, but I can't stomach it. Now, now it's like, what am I going to do? I've invested all this time. There's actually a, 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 te a teacher that I'm not particularly really fond of, but I do like some of his work, Philip Moffat, who's a spirit rock teacher who like left some huge career. He was like, I don't know what magazine it was, but he was like some huge like corporate dude in this big magazine. And he left all that to become a Dharma teacher which is kind of noble. He couldn't stomach Esquire magazine. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have to, and we, and you, and you need to be able to negotiate that for yourself and understanding um, that. And, and just to back up into appropriate happiness sometimes uh, is also to, we, sometimes we work in field and this happens to a lot of people who are medical people work in treatment or trauma or mental health. A lot of times, they're in really non-harming, socially promoting field, but they're totally unhappy. So we have to watch that one too, that we, if we're totally miserable in our job, that's to help others, that's not great. I've met, and this, this is what we see in, in like the clinical world that I'm, I'm a big part of. It's like, you know, people who work in drug and alcohol treatment, people who work in any kind of mental health, um, even therapists, even high-end therapists who get paid tons of money to talk to people about, and that, that can be a kind of a burnout thing. So we, we, have, we have to make sure that we, even if we have a job that's maybe non-harming or even a service kind of job, if we're not happy, that's not okay. You need to look at that and be like, well, I'm doing, and I've heard many people say this, well, I'm doing really good work and I'm helping all these people and it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'm like, yeah, but you're miserable. That's not okay. You know, it's just as bad as being super happy at like, you know, the corporate, you know, it's the same, it's just the other side of that coin. So we have to kind of keep an eye on those kinds of things. Um, so trying to find work that, that you know, maybe isn't totally uh, trying to pr promote and create all this positive change in the world, but something that we can feel kind of good about that feels like, okay, this is, uh, you know, even 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 as a sum zero scenario is fine, right? And that that can that can be hard. Um, the other one I could talk a lot about too, which I think is really important, which boils down to our relationship to money, is trying to find work or trying to uh, get us in a situation where we're living debt free, 
which a lot of people in our culture could take a page out of that book. I mean, we are so in debt, you know, credit cards, student loans, most people think like, like, actually, if you think about it, to actually be broke, you know, would actually be an improvement for a lot of people. Like to have zero, zero would be actually great. I'm like negative, whatever, you know, a couple hundred grand, you know, with all our debt. It's like, I would love to be broke. Broke would be an awesome paradigm for me. And so we, 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 and that really puts renunciation on the table. Can we live within our means? Um, and, you know, I, I think about this all the time. I, 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 it was much easier to, I have children now. And once you have children, you know, the whole means things become, because they, a lot of times the children want things that are outside the domains of what's actually needed, right? And then you have to negotiate that. Um, but I think it's really important that we try to, to, make it, to make enough so that we can live comfortably. Um, my friend Eve Ekman, who I speak of often, has a really great program called Cultivating Emotional Balance. And one of the things that's a part of that secular program is understanding that it's really important that we participate in hedonic pleasure and that it's totally appropriate to 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 live in a secular world and to, to go to movies and to go to shows and to eat at restaurants and to really actually i think part of our practice is to actually enjoy the the fact that we have access to such wonderful things you know uh, movies and uh, friends and shopping and, and and eating and going to all these all these things that you like to do there's nothing wrong with that and, and and i think it's actually not not only is it not wrong i think it's important to see it as part of your practice you know to actually engage and to actually enjoy and to participate in in the hedonic world because the monastics they don't do that um you know, a lot in different traditions have different criteria, but, you know, like even the Theravada tradition, it's like, you know, they're not allowed to sleep on a tall bed or they're not allowed to dance or listen to music or to do artwork or to do a lot of things that many of us probably find that we really enjoy. You know, and they don't do that out of their kind of strict discipline because they're, they're, they're doing a very different thing than we are. I think. You know, I... um you know, I think about this a lot because um, a lot of the things that I've wanted in the hedonic realm uh, either didn't happen or I've lost them. Like, for example, today we we we've had miniature donkeys, and we 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 one of our donkeys that uh, we had to put one of our we didn't actually put them. One of our donkeys literally died today, and we and we and so we we only had one left. We had to bring it back to my parents' house where our other donkeys were, and it was like. We have this big area that I built. There's like no animals in it now. It's like empty. It's like super sad every time I drive down my driveway because it's like, and it's, but, the, but what can happen when we get in pain around that hedonic relationship, we can kind of get into this, well, why bother? Like, why should I try to have good things? Every time I try to have good things or do things, they either don't work out or they, uh, there's disappointment. And a lot of times for me, like that's what actually, there was a couple of times in my life, two or three, I, I've actually I'm really considered going to the monastery a couple of times because I've been like, well, the world is actually unsatisfying and it's all just a, it's all just disappointment and frustration and aggravation. And there's nothing there for me anyway. If it's all just dukkha, I'm not even going to bother. Relationships are too painful. Trying to get a good job is too hard. You know, the world is too expensive. It's like, you know, fuck this. I'm just going to shave my head and put on the brown robes. I'm done. You know, it's because there's a, uh, an attitude and a, and a view and a posture towards that that's very derogatory, that's very nihilistic. So in, in the last several years, a lot of my work has been trying to actually work with my own unhealthy uh, and poverty mentality, posturing towards participating in, in things that are actually enjoyable. You know, and, 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 and I use relationship to, as a big one too, because for me, it was always, it was a big ticket item for a long time because um, I'm sure many of you, uh, some of you have been in relationships, romantic relationships in the past that didn't pan out. You might be familiar with this scenario. And, you know, and if you get hurt enough of times, you can easily go into this like, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. Like, there's, there's, you know, and then and then we avoid it and we build a kind of derogatory tone or we kind of say, well, that's 
there's nothing there for me anyway because I'm a Buddhist right now and I believe I, I seek no external refuge. And you know, we can we can be kind of dharma splaying ourselves out of things that we want to do. When the fact of the matter is, I actually don't. And I was single for most of my 30s because of this. I was like, well, you know, I couldn't be honest with myself. I'm like, well, I would actually prefer to be in an, in an intimate, committed, monogamous relationship. But I'm avoiding that because it's too painful. And we get in these kind of weird polarized experiences in our life where we try to convince ourselves we don't actually want the things that we really, really want because we are afraid they're going to hurt or we're going to get burned or something like that. And so we, if we're not in the monastery, you know, if we're living in the world, we have to work with that stuff. You know, we owe it to ourselves. We can't betray ourselves because we've been hurt before. And so a lot of this really comes into this, um, thinking about the hedonic world as more than just like, you know, getting a new pair of vans or going to get some good food. It's like, it's, it, it's, it's, it's sensory experience. I talked about that last week about it's restraint of senses and that's, you know, taking in people and being in relationships. That's a, that's a big, big world, man. And for most of us, probably a very important world, especially if we have families and, and committed partners and, and, or, you know, committed partners that turned out to not be so committed and, you know, we have to move on. Um, so I think we need to think about that a little bit. And, and the last one I want to speak, I want to speak about, and I want to save some time because I'm really uh, interested in what you have to say about this is again, if back to service, if I, like, can we find work that uh, we feel like we're, we're serving, uh, not necessarily, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to all work for Greenpeace and we don't always have to think about it on those, you know, those higher levels, but can we actually uh, feel as though what I do to survive is somewhat in line with my sense of Dharma? And, you know, it, it, it may be a little easier to do that than you might think. You know, sometimes we think that we have to like work at a retreat center and we have to work for a nonprofit or we have to do some big epic thing, but that's not always the case. And so part of that is if you can find, and I, of course, am, am, I feel very lucky that I've, you know, I'm actually at work right now. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things. I've been able to kind of integrate that and it has pros and it has cons, I'll tell you that. Um, but that's when I think people really start to feel like they're thriving is when they feel like their dharma practice or their dharma work is they're paying attention to it. They're mindful of it. They're seeing it play out in their communication. They're seeing it play out in the work that they're doing in, in the practices that they're doing. They're seeing it play out in their relationship to money or their relationship to actually finding work that's meaningful. And it might be meaningful work that has nothing to do with service. It might be like, maybe you're a musician or a painter or like, who knows? It doesn't have to, you know, and who's to say that that's not service work to, to, to make a beautiful painting so somebody else can, can, can admire it or can see its beauty or to listen to music, you know, who's to say that that's not some kind of service either. Um, and also we have to remember that when we're doing work that's in service, it has to also be in service of ourselves. And that's what ties back into that appropriate happiness. Can I find some enjoyment in this survival, this job that I'm having to do that I would actually prefer to not do, I'd rather do something else. Because if we don't, if we don't kind of kick ourselves in the butt in this way, then this, this is where things just, where we become depressed. We don't find any meaning or we don't find any happiness or we don't find any juice, if you will, in our, in these three path factors. And then it's like, you know, American Buddhism, for lack of a better word, hasn't really, you know, had this conversation. You know, this is not the this is not a conversation that goes on generally in in, in Dharma communities. You know, it's usually you know some esoteric thing or some meditation technique. A lot of times, it's stuff that's fine and interesting. But sometimes I listen to stuff. I'm like. I'll get sucked into Dharma talks and I'll listen to something. I'm like, you know, that was really fun and interesting, but you know what, man, I'm not going to be able to use any of that shit today. I'm not going to be able to like take that and bring it into my fingertips, you know? And so th then we can kind of get into that. We live in that kind of separate reality. And so one of the things that I'm a huge proponent of, 
And I'll talk about this more because we have a, me and my wife, Shannon, actually have a mentoring program that we've been doing and we're taking new students if anybody wants to talk to us about that. But one of the things that I think I get so excited for is when people, students start to have this experience of integration. Because what happens, I think, for many people is you have a practice, you have a seated practice, a Dharma practice that happens on a cushion or a retreat center, you have that, and then you have the rest of your life. And they, 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 they can easily become two different things. And part of that, what sets that dichotomy up is Buddhism doesn't address a lot of the things that we deal with every day. So it's easy to get split and like, well, this is my practice and this is my life. And, you know, then we try to think, well, if I just meditated more, meditated better, I'd be happier. I'm going to meditate my way out of this dilemma that I'm in. It's like, yeah, right. But when there starts to be integration, you start to see, oh, what's going on in the cushion and what's going on the rest of my life. I can see some threads. I can see some overlap. I can see actually how one affects, affects another. I can totally see how they actually are totally connected. And then you start thinking about, you know, and that's why we, I even changed the title. I used to call it meditation mentoring or mindfulness mentoring. I, I dropped that link. I call it Dharma mentoring now because um, I'm interested in a conversation that covers all of these things. And, you know, what happens when you sit on a cushion and pay, put your attention on your breath, maybe is not that profound or that important for you, actually. And so I think that when we um, start to look at this from a more secular perspective, we're just really talking about a full conversation about all of the areas of our life where we can bring uh, these, these qualities that we love, these qualities of mindfulness, of kindness, of compassion, all these things we talk about. Can we actually bring those, cultivate those? Can we actually bring those to ourselves and to the world? And can we, can we learn how to observe how that plays out? Rather than thinking, well, I did some meta practice, you know, this morning, and now I'm just going to like go off and we kind of switch up back onto autopilot, you know? So uh, I want to stop there. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. I would love to hear uh, you, questions are fine. Uh, I'm happy to hear any questions or just how some of this sits with you or some of this. Some of, I'm very interested in some of the ways that maybe you've struggled with some of these teachings in the past. and how it's been kind of hard to negotiate these ideas. Hey, Dave, I do have, I do have a concern. So um, this happened to me not too long ago. I, um, I ended up with some rats in my garage yeah. and I tried trapping them. I got some of them, I mean, over time, right? Over time. And I, I ended up, I just was at my wits end and I had to hire someone to come and get the rats. And I couldn't find anybody that would come and trap them and take them away live. So I ended up hiring someone who I knew was going to kill this rat or poison them. And I was, um, I was, you know, really upset that there are people in the world that this was a service I really needed to have done. I didn't know what else to do. Right. And yet here I am a non-killing Buddhist, you know, privileged to be so. I struggled. I struggled at length about that. And along the lines of what you said in the first class too, where you know that you kill animals for meat, right? Well, here we are trying to talk about, you know, you know, right, um, livelihood. And there, there are people out there that kill animals for a living for, you know, meat for other people to eat uh, or the butchers, you know, that do that and make bacon that we love. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. I, it, it's a struggle. It's a real, it's yeah. a real moral dilemma. How I think do you it's address a great, that? I think it's a great question. And I think, you know, I think we have got to get out of these binaries of like, you sh thou shalt not, you know, like mm -hmm. I, when I lived in Nashville, I had, I had a wicked mouse problem. And this was like when mm -hmm. I was in my Buddhist training and I was like super rigid about this shit. And I was like trying to catch them and I was doing all this, have a heart trap. And I finally hired this company in, and they're like, dude, your house is infested with mice. They're like, we need to like, you need to like go to a hotel for two days and we need <laughs> to like, we need to like dump these, we need to kill this. Probably like the guy was like, there's probably 300 mice in your house. And, you know, he's like, he's like, they're going to destroy your house. Like your house will be destroyed if you don't do this. And I was all like, mm -hmm. well, you know, I don't want to harm the animals and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's like, we just, we have to get beyond that. Like, that's just like not really practical. And so I think part of it is like, you know, 
we have to just be more, I think, liberal or more spacious or more something or other around that space. It's like, like I live in rural Colorado and like, you know, it's so easy to be a, an urban person and kind of these like, you know, people who are anti-killing animals. But it's like, I have friends, I know guys out here who go out and hunt and they hunt and they kill animals and they feed their family for a year off the three animals they killed. I got mm-hmm. a lot more respect for that person than the person who goes on the Whole Foods and buys the free range chicken, mm-hmm. frankly. Right. I really yeah. do. Yeah, you know, somebody I and, agree they, with and that. they respect and they respect the earth and they respect the animals and they appreciate that the animal is going to feed their family. And it's a whole kind of spiritual thing for some of these dudes. Mm-hmm. You know, they go hunting to feed their family. And it's like, and I like really respect that. It's like a spiritual practice for some people. And to get on some high horse, they're like, well, that's bad and wrong. It's like you have to you really have to look at the intention and the motivation behind these things. Now, big, huge, like uh, you know, what do they call it? The, the, these huge farms, you know, like corporate, uh, what, whatever they're called, mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that, that's terrible. You know what I mean? But, right. but you can't lump it all in there and you can't say, well, you know, you can't compare the guy, my neighbor who goes out and shoots a couple elk and a couple deer and feels to feed his family for a year. You can't compare him to these huge mm-hmm. agri farms. Like that's just, that's right. just like not very intelligent. Right. And, and, and that's kind of the point I, I got to after agonizing over over the rat killer guy, um, I thanked him for his service, you know, yeah, because he he provided me with a really good service and I paid him well. Um, yeah. So you know, um, you got to do what you got to do. I did find that sweet spot, I think, in between what really needed to be done and who needed to do it. I knew I I personally could not do it. I couldn't reach that point myself, but right, and that's but, the yeah. middle. That sweet spot is a very nice way to say there was a middle way there for you. Mm-hmm. Right, there was, and yeah. and also for like for me, like one of the things that I do is I generally say like the I I believe I do believe, and this is just my opinion. I believe that the first precept is kind of in a calling for vegetarianism, and I think mm-hmm. if you know if part of the plan, part of the problem with the planet and climate change and global changes, people are eating too much meat. It's just right. kind of well known, uh, but that's not enough for me to stop eating it. I do eat it, but I try to eat ethical meat. I try to buy meat from the local guys that I know here and I, I don't mm-hmm. eat it all the time, but I also right. am not trying. I also just mostly would say that I don't really feel like I truly practice the first precept rather than trying to justify it which is usually what Buddhist teachers do. They'll come up with some kind of justification why it's okay. Where I'm just saying, like, I don't think the Buddha said it was okay. And, and, but, but I'm just going to be honest about that. And I think sometimes we have to, and that's a kind of a secular thing to do of like, I'm not a religious Buddhist. I don't follow everything to a T. I, I try really, really hard to be harmless in that way. And I think I mostly am. But for me to think that the, the, the beef that I eat or the chicken that I eat isn't causing some harm would just be, I'd just be lying to myself. Well, and also in sticking to that one precept, I find there's a big difference between eating the occasional meat and understanding where your meat comes from and all that, and deciding that every wasp on the planet has to die or deserves to die right. uh, because they have their place in the world too, right? They, they're they just trying to make a living like we all are. Um, so I have a neighbor that I dealt with on that issue. And I said, no, no, we're not going to hire a pesticide company to come and spray the trees between our houses. We're going to, we're going to take down the wasp nests that are excessive and we're going to get rid of those to a place where they can, they can survive, right? right. They can have a chance, but we're not going to go in and just wholesale kill them. Again, well, then there becomes you know, a hierarchy of what life is more valuable than others. And it's exactly, like, well, exactly. And, now, and then, now you've missed the whole point. Yeah. And then, and then the ants take over or, you know, you got to have balance, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was a good topic. Thank you. No, thank you. I, I think that I think all these kinds of things are important and relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tia, please. Um, I uh, I would be really curious to hear you talk more about uh, non attachment versus renunciation. Not like they're up against each other, but I think that I don't know. In some ways, from what you've been saying these last, these over these talks, the, the kind of that's the uh, uh, balance point or the discernment point between a monastic, some monastic precepts and and trying to manage in the non-monastic world. No, I hear you. Between renunciation and non-attachment, is that what you said? 
Yeah, and, and those things are so, those are, again, attachment versus non-attachment. That's just a wicked binary. Like, is there a, is there like kind of attached? You know what I mean? Like, like, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of attached to a lot of stuff. I wouldn't say I got my nails dug in, but to say that I, that I to have total non-attachment is like, I don't know if, I just don't even know if I could even, I don't even know how that would even work, you know? So I think, um, so understanding that non-attachment and attachment, there's a degree, there's a whole range between those ideas that we need to kind of, you know, just think about it a little bit more intelligently, right? You know, like, um, you know, and so that's why equanimity is so important in this conversation. It's like, I'm a little bit attached, or maybe I'm a lot of bit attached. I know I'm attached to this thing in my life. I hope that it works out. But if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be okay. That's where equanimity comes in. I'm going to be okay if this doesn't happen, or I'm going to be okay if this happens, but I'm pretty attached to it working out. You know? Like I'm pretty attached to making my monthly nut every month. Like I'm pretty attached to that. And if it didn't happen one month, I'd figure something out. It'd be okay, but I'm attached. And and I think that we we have to as as people who really live in the world and need money and and have rats in our garage, we really have to have a much more kind of uh, realistic frame on some of these things. Now, renunciation typically is kind of a derogatory term because renunciation, we hear that and it sounds like, oh, now they're going to come and take all my cool shit away. You know, like, so I don't like the, the word renunciation. I think it's nakama in Pali. Nakami is the word. It's, um, it's kind of more about not needing anything extra. Renunciation is a kind of acknowledgement that I have needs and that I have wants. And then that renunciation practice is, there's actually a lot of joy in renunciation. And, and it, it's a it's really, renunciation, the best way to view it is it's a practice. It's trying to do without. I'm gonna do without this for a little while and see what happens. I'm gonna do without this for a little while. It's not, again, it's not this black and white. I'm either gonna do this or I'm not gonna do this. That's just, we know right now, it gets a lot of topic in, in, in our culture, like binaries are not really helpful. You know, like that's not a great kind of worldview. So, you know, part of it is seeing it as practice is, um, yeah, like someone wrote in here, giving up something for Lent. It's like giving up something, because a lot of times the stuff that we have to renounce, like as somebody in recovery, a lot of the things that I renounce or that I give up are things that are actually harmful to me. You know? And so part of it is like, you know, part of it, I think what renunciation really points to and kind of, a modern frame is that um, is that I'm willing to delay my gratification rather than always going for the instant gratification. You know, I, I, I'm gonna, I can go without dessert this time. I can go without this thing. I can, uh, I want to get this thing for my house or my kids or my whatever, whatever. I, I'm, I'm not going to do it this time. It's a practice. It's a not needing anything extra. And I think there's a lot of joy in that. And I think that we, um, I always, I, every day, I, I'm always having some kind of renunciation practice going on. And it's not final. It's not like I'm sticking my flag and I shall never eat sugar again. It's like, no, I try to eat less sugar as a, as a renunciation practice. So again, we have to get out of this really strict, like attachment, non-attachment, do it, not do that. And in Buddhism, because of the nons and the non-greed and the, is that it really kind of, but it's just giving you the like extremes, right? It's like, okay, here's this and here's that. But we always forget, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle. You know, like I don't practice the first precept exactly how I think it's said, but I think I'm like 90%, like I'm really pretty good, actually. Like I don't, I don't enjoy killing bugs. I don't go outside with a BB gun and shoot the prairie dogs because I like shooting prairie dogs. That's, no, that's, that's different, right? Very different. I don't, I don't get enjoyment. I, I actually don't like it and I loathe it. And I, and I, you know, like, like you and suffered pretty good over the rat. Like, you know, you didn't, but so, so you have to, the Dalai Lama talks about it. It's not what we do. It's the intention behind it that we really need to learn how to watch. You know, it's like the, the analogy is it's like what people talk about karma or whatever. It's like, you know, the person who drives down the road and accidentally runs over the squirrel is much different than the person who drive down the road and tried to like steer into it and were happy that they, hey, I got him. Does in in both cases the squirrel's gone. 
both people kill the squirrel, but those are very, very, very different things. You see what I mean? See why that's so important? Very different. Outcomes are the same. We could say it's the same action. I killed the squirrel, you killed the squirrel. Why is your killing of the squirrel worse than my killing of the squirrel? It's like, because you, tr- you tried to hit him, you wanted to hit him, you did hit him, and then you were happy that you hit him. That's very different. Because what you're, what you're starting to, is you're, now you're talking about what's going on in the mind of the individual. That's really what we're looking for, is what's going on in the mind of the individual. Not so much in the external outcomes as much, but really trying to, and that's because we are the first person user experience what is going on in the mind of my own individual if that makes sense you see why that's so yes nuanced. otherwise we become bad buddhists really quick you know We maybe have time for one more reflection. But time goes by so fast. So I'm going to put my email in here. I have some stuff going up. I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion because I need to, to survive. satisila74 at gmail.com is my email address. You can also find me at davesmithdharma.com. Um, and I have a bunch of stuff going on that you're welcome to participate in. I mentioned it the last two times. Me, uh, the Secular Dharma Foundation has a big program that's starting in January. It's a 15 month immersive dharma program which has three in-person retreats a whole online component um it's limited people i think there's actually only maybe three or four spaces left but you'll be in a 15-year cohort with the same people going through the eightfold path looking at this stuff from secular perspectives just three actual residential retreats um and there's going to be some guest teachers involved. Um, if you're interested in that, just send me an email and I'll send you the links and you can read out about that. I'm not going to inundate you with details now, but if that's something that you're interested in, a long-term study program with residential retreats, hit me up. Also, we're about to send an email out. So if you're on the Day Smith Dharma list, you'll see it anyway. But, you know, me, me and my wife, Shannon, since I've been doing it for years, but really since COVID, we've been... Uh, doing a, we have a Dharma mentoring program, which is a meeting with us one-on-one. We have a weekly practice group that's only for the people in the program, and there's an online learning management system library. Um, so if you're looking to work with somebody one-on-one and you want to kind of have a little bit of peer support um, and, and work with a teacher, uh, mentor is the word I use because the word teacher has kind of been a little bit, uh, had some issues in the last few years. But if you're interested in, in, in doing more stuff with me or seeing what I have out there, you can, you can, everything that I do is basically on, on my website, except for this program, this 15 month program is not really, we haven't advertised it and we're not going to. So it's kind of an invite. Um, I think I did write my email address. It's, uh, oh, I didn't send it to everybody. Sorry. Everyone. S-A-T-I. I can't see. I'm right there, right? Yep. It's satisila74 at gmail.com. I also have another one that's probably easier to remember. Dave at seculardharmafoundation.com. We also have a Secular Dharma Foundation website, but there's not a whole bunch of stuff on there. So anyway, if you're interested in doing stuff with me further or checking out uh, some of the offerings I have, you can just, you. Can, I don't get a ton of emails. If you email me, I will get back to you right away. Um, so anyway, feel welcome and invited to to check that out if you wish. I can't believe I did four and a half hours on the Seal of Path Factors, man. I feel like I should get a trophy. <laughs> <laughs>